So what's up, Poppy friends, and welcome to the second video of my Blood Angels Horus Heresy painting series. In this video, I'm going to be talking about how I approach painting a larger model. I will be doing my Leviathan Dreadnought, largely because he's in a greater number of sub-assemblies, and I think more so than just talking about their recipes, the approach for this is going to be a little bit different from the infantry, and I figured it would be a great way to show not only the benefits of the sub-assembly process, but how it greatly improves the efficiency of this army painting. So if you haven't watched the first video where I paint my Blood Angels Dawnbreaker, I highly recommend you do check that out because I will probably be going into greater detail in terms of my color choices. And this video really expands on that and takes the same techniques that we applied in the first video, painting infantry and applying it to the vehicle. So some things I'll be speeding through because I've already covered it in the first one. So as always, we've built the miniature, we've primed him black, and you'll notice that I've sub-assembled him in a lot of separate components. And the reason for this is because of the way that the model assembles and the way that certain panels overlap, it actually creates more work if we build the entire model together, airbrush the red, and then we'll have to go back in and repaint the black for any sort of metallic or black components. Additionally, if we were to build the entire model as a whole, it does create some awkward angles where we can't really get our highlighting happening as accurately as I would want to, especially when we get to things like um, this top plate and then the side plates and the torso. And then when we get to the abdomen, there's a front plate right here. And if we remove that abdomen part, there's the hip plates right there as well. Just by keeping it separate, it just allows me to airbrush more accurately and more quickly. And then um, by keeping it separate, for example, on the torso, with the arms in, it becomes incredibly awkward to paint all those black and metallic elements on the inside, but with the arms separate, nothing's in the way. So it's one of those models where on vehicles and on dreadnoughts and sometimes characters, I think it can be worth it sub-assembling into individual components where you're not painting like 10 dreadnoughts, right? Having an infantry model sub-assembled into four separate components to make it easy to paint means that in a squad of 10, that's 40 separate pieces to keep track of. And then because Marines tend to have paired arms or paired weapons or whatever, can get a little complex. Whereas with something like a Leviathan Dreadnought, I'm painting one of these at a time. I'm not worried about mixing and matching and confusing the parts together. So as with the infantry, we're going to start by airbrushing our base and our Dreadnought. I won't cover painting the base in this video. I've already talked about it in the previous painting the infantry video. For the Dreadnought Red Armor, we're going through AK's Reddish Black, Burnt Red, and blood red. Once again, um, focusing high contrast, top to bottom, but we're gonna spend a little bit more time painting some of the middle and lower panels of the armor. In particular, the legs, I wanna have the hip plates um, a little bit brighter than it would be on the infantry equivalent. And we're gonna spend a little more time focusing on um, making sure that we capture some strong highlights, not just on the torso, but on things like the shoulders and on the abdomen and crotch plates as well. So I'm gonna be jumping into some oil washes once I've done the airbrushing. Just like with the infantry, this is because I'm doing it all at the exact same time, just a, an optimization process for the painting of the army. So I've already started and done it on a, a couple of the panels on the feet of the dreadnought. But really all we're looking to do is just um, use capillary action and we're just going to let the oil wash flow into the crevices. And just like with the infantry, um, while the paint is still damp and while we still have some moisture on the brush, make sure that you moisten the entire surface of the armor. This way the pigments won't sit on that border between wet and dry areas and it won't leave these unsightly tide marks. It's okay to also do the wash um, in a light sort of capacity over the entire armor. A little bit will subtly um, shade and darken, especially these darker areas, help to accentuate the shadows. And then when we go back in and start to hand paint some of those red highlights back in, we can then polish up and um, really add that punch and that vibrancy. And as always, because I haven't gloss varnished these models, because I don't want the finish of uh, the gloss varnish, even after a matte seal, I need to be careful to not let the oil paint pool um, and 
flow out of these crevices. I want to apply just enough where the pigment will sit in the crevices and lightly stain the surface. So when we start painting our dreadnought, the first thing that we're going to want to tackle is the armor. So the color recipes in this video are the exact same as my How to Paint Blood Angels infantry that I released last week. So if you want a more detailed breakdown, I do recommend that you check that video out as well. The steps are going to be largely the same on this model, but when we're painting something like the Leviathan Dreadnought or a vehicle that has larger surface area, larger panels of armor, we do need to spend a little bit of time talking about the approach, especially since we're going to be hand painting our highlights. I tend to avoid leaving my vehicles at an airbrush state, largely because the gap that you end up having between your infantry and your vehicles, the quality of the finish is distinctly different. And if I want to be hand painting blends on my infantry, I want to make sure that I'm hand painting blends on my vehicles. So the obvious first step is we're going to need to use a bigger brush, um, especially in the initial stages of doing the armor. So when I'm doing the blood red and the scarlet red, I'm going to be going in with a size four brush. It's a little bit older, not as fine of a tip, but it means that I can apply paint on a larger area per stroke. And especially when I'm doing sort of my cross hatching technique, every subsequent highlight I lay down, I move my brush stroke in a different direction. That helps me to cover up the previous layer. And over time, as I build up my highlights, the overall finish ends up being smoother. We also need to make sure that we're diluting our paint sufficiently to allow it to cover smoothly without being too diluted as to pool and leave too many brush strokes showing through. And then finally, when we're doing our airbrushing stage, we need to make sure that we're leaving very strong, large flat areas of that blood red highlight. So that when we go back in by hand and we're picking up those key panels and those key edges to highlight, we're able to quickly lay down that color and work our way up. Once you've gotten that blood red um, highlight pretty much evenly applied and you're ready to move on to scarlet red and amaranth red, all the hard work is done. You're really leaning on that blood red transition into scarlet red to form the majority of your color. The silver recipe is the exact same as infantry. We're going to begin with a base coat of black metal. And then on top of that, I'm going to do a heavy application of a known oil wash from Games Workshop, making sure not to use the gloss version. I want the matte version. And then because I'm working on a vehicle, I'm actually going to go back in with black metal, neaten up my wash before going back in with heavy metal and doing a further highlight. What I'm going to want to do to make my painting process easier, because I want to avoid spending too much time on my army models, is particularly around the joints, use more of the metal recipe and less of the black. I find that metal, especially with this sort of base coat wash highlight, is far easier and faster to paint than doing the black blend and edge highlighting. So the more I can lean on these easy techniques, the things like joins, um, a lot of the inner details and workings, the faster this painting process becomes, especially because the focus of this model is going to be the armor I want it to pop. Once we've done the silver metal, we're going to do the black elements, uh, areas on the inner details that I do want to have just to offset the amount of silver, create a bit of textural and material variety, and then areas like the gun and weapon casings we're going to do in our black recipe. So it's AK rubber or AK black, rubber black, and ash gray as our base coat to highlight progression. And I'm going to spend a little more time, especially on the larger surface areas like this uh, cyclonic ion melt. Um, cyclonic melt lens to make sure that the blend is a little bit smoother. And then from there, I'll do my edge highlight of graphite because this is a vehicle with more of a centerpiece model. I'll highlight more of the edges. I'll be a little bit neater than I would on a bolter casing for a tactical marine. And then I'll go back in with some pure warm gray and pick out some of the finer points um, and specular highlight just to give the black a bit of pop. There's not really a lot of gold on this particular model, so I'm really just focusing this on the front grill plate on the sarcophagus, the base coat of our scale color decayed metal, and then a quick highlight pass with Vallejo's gold. Again, make sure that you're shaking up that Vallejo gold bottle, otherwise the paint ends up a little bit too watery and it's going to splash everywhere on your palette. So I didn't 3D print a lot of 
iconography and detail elements for this Leviathan Dreadnought, it's a lot of flat armor, which does mean that we're gonna end up freehanding quite a few um, icons, uh, check marks and stripe markings just to give the model a little bit more detail, a bit more white pop and to tie it in with your iconography on my infantry. So the color SP is the same as the infantry and on the base, it's that um, medium sea gray base coat highlighting through pale blue, greenish white, and white. When you're painting things like freehand um, checks and lines and other iconography, I'm going to start with a very diluted base coat of medium sea gray and a fine tip brush. Draw in or paint in those edges, fill it in with the medium sea gray, and then from there it's just highlighting up as normal. To create a softer fade, you can actually keep that medium sea gray nice and diluted even as you're building up your base coats and really exaggerate that blend or that contrast between your shadow tone and your base coat tone all the way up to your highlight. Especially on the lower parts of the model, you don't have to take it all the way to greenish white all the time. You can keep it in that medium sea gray to pale blue mix range and only take it up to greenish white on like the edge highlights. So for example, um, I painted this check pattern on one of his knee pads and you can see how I have faded that check mark pattern by not going all the way to pure white and exaggerating that blend along the way. For the eyes, I'm starting with a base coat of AK's Dark Sea Blue, and I'm highlighting through dark green, light green, and livery green, focusing closer and closer to the front of the face for my highlights. And then once that's done, I'll do a blue dot, white dot, specular point on the outside edges of both of the lenses to get that spot highlight um, in there and popping those eyes. For the array of searchlights on the torso, I'm going to paint them in the same recipe that I painted the yellow caution stripes and pipes on the base. I'm going to start with a base coat of AK's World War I French brown and then highlight up through number, Earth's, number six earth yellow, volcanic yellow, and yellow focusing closer and closer to the center of the search lights. And then from there, I'll just do a quick black line um, or brown line down the center of each one with the base tone of French brown, just to define that crease or that cross mark for the search lights. Once I have everything painted on the dreadnought, where necessary, I'll go back in with my blood red, scarlet red, and amaranth red and just touch up any overpaints on any of the armor and red elements where I made a mistake in painting the other parts of the model. On my larger models, so my dreadnoughts and my vehicles, along with my characters, I tend to want to use decals to add a little bit of extra detail and flair to make them also stand out and pop from your basic line infantry. So I'll be using the Forge World decal sheet for this. I'm going to start by preparing the area where I want to apply my decals. I'm going to use a bit of Vallejo's gloss varnish that I'll paint by hand and basically smooth out and gloss out the area where the decal will be. Overpaint around the edges so that it's larger than the actual surface area of the decal. While that's drying, you can cut out the decals and soak them in clean water. So I have a, a dish or a tray I have set aside for this. And to grip each decal, I have a tweezer that I just hold or clamp it onto while it soaks in the water. After about 30 seconds or a minute, the decal will start to separate from the sheet. I'll take it out of the water, wick away most of the water with a spare paper towel, and then using a clean brush, slide the transfer onto the prepared gloss varnish area. Using a bit of water, you can position the decal until it's um, right where you want it and you're happy with the final position. And then I will use some testers decal setting solution to basically fix the decal to the model. I'll do a couple of passes of this decal set, especially on the more complex curved surfaces. And then once that's dry, I'll be able to give the entire model a coat of matte varnish and that'll knock back the decal set as well as the gloss varnish we applied to the model in preparation. The final step of painting our model is to apply a, a shade glaze using our airbrush. So I'll be using Games Workshop's new wash for this. Druchi Violet in particular, I found 
airbrushes very, very well. You don't even need to dilute it. I'm just going to use a dropper bottle to um, transfer some to my airbrush. And then I'm going to spray from underneath with a low PSI and just gently glaze it onto the model, spraying a bit of color, not letting it spider everywhere, and then using the airbrush to air dry each layer before applying the next. Keep it soft. I don't want to overdo the purple. And what this will do is smooth out any sort of rough patches, especially in the mid to dark tones. And when I'm focusing this on the lower part of the model and the back of the model, along with the back part of the base, adds that extra level of nuance and just that subtle, cool tone in the shadows that darkens everything and smooths it all together. And with that, our Leviathan Dreadnought is complete. The approach to painting a larger model is the same as painting infantry. We just need to spend more time in the mid-tone color range, and that requires a little bit more forethought in both the airbrushing step as well as when working up the blends by hand, in particular the blood red and scarlet red colors. But really, once you've nailed the armor, everything else just clicks into place. And you can take this approach to painting models with more rigid or angular painting, like this Rhino Transport. I approached this vehicle exactly the same way as the Dreadnought, going heavy with the blood red airbrush step, and then spending more time by hand with the blood red and scarlet red highlights, just like with the Dreadnought. I also exaggerated the value jump from the front and top of the vehicle when compared to the sides and the rear. This allows me to cheat the amount of effort I need to put into painting some of these larger armor panels, especially as I got around to the rear of the vehicle where there really isn't much hand painting outside of the airbrush steps, and it allows you to really quickly work up the vehicle despite its size. So that wraps up this video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more awesome weekly content. Until next time, happy hobbying.